Thank you and welcome everyone to this second installment of our two part series, our UC Agriculture and Natural Resources webinar series on integrating livestock and orchards or integrating livestock into orchard and vineyard systems. My name is Sonia Brodt and I'm with the UC Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. And I'd like to first thank Paulina Binsfeld, our Crop Livestock Integration Intern, who has taken the lead in organizing this session for us today. And I also want to thank my two other UC a &R colleagues, Rebecca Ozran and Jackie Beck. Um, and I also want to quickly mention that our team is organizing an in-person symposium on this very topic of crop livestock integration to be held on September 2nd in Hopland. And I think um, Paulina may talk a little bit more about that later, but you can look for that registration link in the chat. Uh, so let's see, let me quickly go through a few housekeeping items here. Um, first, you should be staying on mute at this time and please keep yourself muted. Uh, you can use the mute controls at the bottom left corner of your screen to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. And if you're only joining by phone, you can use star six to mute and unmute yourself. That's star six. There will be some question and answer periods and you can go ahead and write questions and comments in the chat as much as you like and we'll be monitoring that as we go along. Or you can also raise your hand um, and you can go to the reactions button at the bottom right of your screen to find that. Or if you're on the phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. Um, and finally, if you want to see only the person currently speaking, you can go to the top right of your screen and click on view and then change from gallery to speaker view. Um, and a couple other notes here, you can, if you would like the Zoom to provide an automatic real-time transcription of the audio, you can go to the bottom of your screen by clicking on more and uh, you can see that on the screen that I'm showing and going up and choosing live transcript. And finally, I'd just like to remind everybody that today's webinar is being recorded and we'll be posting it online in the next few weeks. Um, so I think we're gonna just so that we know who is here and if we're serving everybody we want to serve with these webinars, we're gonna do a little poll uh, just to see who we're reaching. And please fill that out. Oh, it looks like it got ended accidentally. I'm going to relaunch the poll. I accidentally just ended it. Sorry. There we go. Sorry. If you had responded, could you please fill it out again? We just, um, this is, as Sonia said, this is just to make sure we're serving all of our communities, but it is anonymous. So we don't know who you are when you submit. Thanks. We'll give it about another 10 seconds. Looks like we've got a really good response already. All right, I'm gonna end it and thank you all so much. I'll turn it back over to you, Sonia. All right, thank you. Um, let's see, I would like to especially introduce um, Dan Makin, who's our UC Cooperative Extension Advisor in Sutter and Yuba counties. And he's also a partner in a commercial sheep operation in Auburn. So he's coming at this topic from all sides. Uh, so Paulina, am I turning it over to Dan or to you first? You can go ahead and turn it over to Dan. Yeah, we'll start with Dan and then we'll get into um, some of the rest of our speakers. So Dan, can- All right, thanks. Dan, take it away. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry to uh, be snuffly tonight, but uh, after two and a half years, I finally got caught by COVID. So I'm, uh, I'll, I apologize if I start sneezing or coughing in the middle of this. And just to clarify, I'm also Livestock and Natural Resources Advisor for Placer in Nevada counties and County Director in Placer in Nevada County. So like a lot of bald guys, wear lots of different hats. And I will see if I can get this shared here. Can you see it in uh, presentation mode yet? We 
see your slides. Uh, not yeah, that's better. Okay, that, that work. Yep. All right. Thank you. All right. So there's a couple of things that I want to talk about um, this evening to start off with, and and one is the, is the contrast between contract grazing and livestock production. It's a spectrum, but there are some differences depending on what we're emphasizing, whether it's contract grazing or livestock production. Talk a little bit about the principles of managed grazing and how that applies to grazing and, and um, cropping systems. Provide some observations from my um, experience doing this. And then I also wanna thank Cooperative Extension and the UC SEREP program for making this possible tonight. So really, if we think about contract grazing, it is the application of a specific kind of livestock at a determined season, duration, and intensity to accomplish defined vegetation or landscape goals. The major difference between good grazing management and contract grazing is that contract grazing refocuses the outputs from livestock production to vegetation management. This is taken from the targeted grazing handbook that was uh, developed oh, I think about 15 years ago by Karen Launchball up in um, at University of Idaho. And, and it really does apply to contract grazing. It's a real shift in, in, um, in how we view the purpose of the animals on the landscape. So what's the difference between contract grazing and, and vegetation or uh, and livestock production? As I said, in contract grazing, the main focus is to provide the right animals at the right time. Uh, production activities are scheduled around that vegetation management. If the focus is more in livestock production, our main focus is on reproduction and weight gain primarily. And so there may be opportunities where we can do vegetation management um, around those production activities, but we're really focused on the right, um, getting, getting the animals to the right place at the right time in terms of reproduction and weight gain. So if we think about kind of the characteristics of these two types of operations, um, a contract grazing operation may have mixed species and mixed age classes, and in some cases may include older weathers or castrated males that can impact low quality vegetation. And the reason for that is that those, those older weathers don't have the nutritional demands that a reproducing female might have. On a livestock production standpoint, we may have multiple species, but they're typically run as separate flocks. Um, we're typically gonna run our replacement females separate from our breeding females and weathers are what we market to make money. On the primary income streams, um, contract grazers are really looking at maximizing the amount of money returned from being out on those contracts. Whereas uh, if our focus is more purely on livestock production, the main sources of income are the sale of lambs or kids or the sale of fiber. In both cases, there are secondary income streams, and that's part of the benefit of using livestock in this way is that we've got these, these multiple income streams if we're doing contract grazing. Our management emphasis in contract grazing is to make animals available for the contracts and to maximize days that we're getting paid. Um, we want to <clears throat> use high stock density to impact vegetation. And in some cases, we may accept some nutritional stress in order to, to accomplish the vegetation management goals that we're trying to achieve. On the livestock production side of things, our focus is on reproduction and, and pounds of wool or pounds of meat, as I mentioned. Um, and we're really focusing on nutrition at key times in the production phase. So with sheep and goats, for example, um, just prior to the breeding season, we can vastly increase the amount of, of um, reproductive success we have simply by increasing plate of nutrition. Um, that may or may not be something we can do if we're contract grazing. And then lastly, uh, from the standpoint of reproduction, if we're in contract grazing, we're timing reproduction to allow maximum days on contracts and really to avoid birthing on jobs, um, lambing or kidding, particularly in contract jobs that are, are um, accessible to the public can be, um, can be challenging. We are also likely to accept lower conception and weaning rates and weaning weights in exchange for increasing grazing income. So if, I, if we're producing, um, our primary product is lambs or, or kids, 
we're going to want to have those ewes or does on the highest quality feed while they're lactating that we can have. If we're contract grazing, that may not be as high a priority. There are some dietary preferences, differences in dietary preferences. And, and part of this is really thinking about the right critter for the job. Um, goats and sheep both have greater preference for broadleaf plants and certainly goats um, have a, a greater predilection for brush. Goats also apparently have the ability to neutralize some tannins, which is a secondary compound in some brush um, species that can create some challenges for browsing. Some sheep, uh, my sheep certainly are adapted to browse, will eat brush, um, but not all. And then cattle um, are primarily grass um, grazers. And so um, it really depends on the type of um, vegetation that we're looking at managing. Goats typically graze from the shoulder height up and may pull down higher brush. Sheep and, and cows typically graze from shoulder height down. And then some of the limitations and, and challenges certainly for small ruminants would be susceptibility to predators. Um, there's no more difficult animal to fence than a hungry sheep or a hungry goat. Um, there's no sheep feed fence ever invented that'll hold a hungry sheep. And then with sheep, obviously, we may need to shear them annually, depending on the speed on the breed of sheep that we're, we're managing. On cattle, um, we may have different infrastructure requirements, and we certainly have a longer gestation period, which um, limits our ability to handle nutritional stress as well. So if we think about the principles of grazing management, first and foremost, from a contract grazing standpoint, we wanna time the grazing to accomplish specific goals at a specific growth phase. So for example, with yellow star thistle, we want to graze star thistle at the point when about 10% of the plants are flowering. Um, depending on the year, that can be a very short window. Um, and so we have to be able to, to adjust our grazing schedules to accomplish that um, particular um, objective. We also wanna use the shortest graze period possible and the highest stock density possible because that's, um, going to help us with a, another objective that I'll get here to in just a moment. And then the last thing that we want to pay attention to is how we use the other animal impacts, primarily trampling and, and manure deposition to achieve our vegetation management goals. Some of the vegetation in our environment may be better trampled than grazed. And so um, by using high stock density and short graze periods, we can accomplish that. These two points in particular lead to greater uniformity of treatment. So if you think about when you go to a potluck dinner, if there's only a couple of you at the dinner, um, you're going to just take the stuff that you like, right? But if the room is full and there's lots of stuff and there's lots of people in line ahead of you, you're going to try some of everything just because you want to see what's there. And it's the same with animals where we're manage managing them with high stock density they're more likely to eat the plants that are not quite as palatable if we have um, greater stock density and, and we're moving them through quickly. I think if you talk to contract grazers, um, almost to the person, they will tell you that it's easier to build an animal for their operation than it is to buy one. And by that, I mean, we can really affect grazing behavior and grazing preferences by the way the animals are raised and by what they're exposed to as young animals. Um, Fred Provenza, who did a lot of research on this topic at Utah State, phrased it, mother knows best. And he, he really studied the fact that, that lambs and kids learn what to eat by watching their mothers. This is a set of our sheep this last spring, um, first day into a patch of milk thistle, <coughs> excuse me. And within 24 hours, that patch was gone, um, both because the lambs and the, and the ewes ate it. Livestock also get both positive and negative feedback from the plants that they graze. And so, <coughs> excuse me, when they have positive feedback, it makes them want to graze that particular plant more. Negative feedback, which we can manipulate, which we have manipulated through um, some experiments here at, at UCANR. I think Morgan Doran is on here and was part of that um, vines and ovines project. Um, we can create negative feedback for particular 
um, plants that will discourage animals from grazing those plants. And that's really one of the mechanisms that helps animals avoid toxic plants as well. The bottom line is we typically can't run to the sale barn and pick up animals that will perform well in our own systems. Um, and I think that's important to recognize as well. So grazing for vegetation management is a real shift from livestock production to grazing for vegetation goals. Contract, <coughs> excuse me, contract grazing incorporates all grazing impacts, um, removing vegetation, trampling, and, and nutrient cycling to achieve particular goals. And then I think the other key point to take away is that once you're done grazing cover crop, you don't just lock the sheep in a shed and wait till next year. Um, that's a year round commitment. And so thinking about that year long forage calendar is really important, whether you're doing um, livestock production or, or contract grazing. I would pause for just a sec to see if there's any questions. <coughs> Otherwise I can go on and, and talk a little bit about our experiences. And I apologize for coughing. <clears throat> All right, so a few observations from our experience with contract grazing. We've operated um, at between 50 and 250 ewes um, since 2006. We dabbled in goats and decided that we were sheep people. Um, not that there's anything wrong with goat people, but um, I get along better with sheep for whatever reason that might be. For, for about five years, uh, we focused on contract grazing and did a lot of work, um, which I'll talk about here in Placer County primarily. And our current focus for a variety of reasons is on production. So our main sources of income are on our lamb sales and on our wool sales. We do provide some contract grazing services, but it's very minimal. So this, the animation didn't quite work like I'd hoped on this. Um, but this is our kind of forage calendar as a production focused operation. So we lamb in February when the grass is really starting to grow here, which means we breed in October. Um, and then it sets up the rest of our, our time frame as well. <coughs> I want you to look at the, the areas where we've got low nutritional um, demand. Um, there in July and August, and again in November and December. And that's the time frame when we can make sheep available for doing um, contract grazing. So we do fuel load reduction in July and August in, in Auburn. And then in the past, we have done um, some crop residue um, in berry vineyards and, and grazed on alfalfa stubble as well. If we were focused on contract grazing, our, our production calendar would look very different. So we would probably be lambing in October and November, which means that we would breed in May and June. Our time frame of, of low um, to moderate nutritional demand is going to be different because of that different cycle as well. And so if we're lambing in October, that means we're going to still shear in March. We're going to vaccinate our ewes in September. We're gonna wean our lambs in March as well. But we've got this whole time period from um, early May, late April, early May on into September where we can make animals available for, con for contract grazing. Now, one of the caveats to this might be that if we are doing cover crop grazing in this scenario, we might be able to provide animals in February and March, even though our nutritional demand is very high. Um, because the forage quality in those cover crop stands is also potentially very high. Um, but that's complicated in this situation by the fact that we'd be moving pairs as opposed to single dry use into that type of scenario. So I think one of the things to think about for this particular model is that it requires specific breeds and adequate forage in the late fall and winter. Greatest forage demand for our sheep or for any, any animal is at birth and, and immediately after birth. Um, and we need to make sure that we've got enough nutrition to go into them at that point. It also requires breeds that are able to reproduce and lamb um, in the fall. And most of those breeds 
with the exception of Dorpers and Dorset sheep from England, um, are going to be Southern Mediterranean sheep, Rambouillet or Merino sheep that um, cycle year round. Sheep from Northern Europe and Northern England typically will not cycle um, when the days are growing longer. So our experience, most of the work that we do here in the foothills has been in fuel load reduction and, and invasive weed management. We have grazed cover crops for a couple of small farmers here in Placer County near Auburn and also grazed um, crop residue in vegetables um, for those operations. We've done a little bit of work in stone fruit and mandarin orchards on, on managing orchard floors. And then uh, in the last couple of years, we've worked with a UPIC berry operation here in Auburn to graze post-harvest um, to reduce the amount of overwintering insects um, in their operation. Our clientele have included private landowners, um, homeowners associations, farmers. We've worked some with PG&E. Um, this picture is from Sierra College. We grazed at Sierra College for several years. And as the story goes, apparently saved the Sierra College campus from a flaming squirrel that got electrocuted in the power lines and fell into an area where we had grazed. Um, and the fire didn't go anywhere. So that, I guess that's my superpower, saving humankind from flaming squirrels. Cost factors and management challenges, in my experience, transportation is a big one and, and getting bigger. Um, $6 diesel makes it difficult to, to pencil a lot of movement of livestock um, on the highway. It does require extra labor. Even at our small scale right now, um, I've got three different ranches or properties that I need to be at every day. And so that spreads labor pretty thin. Forage quality, because we're, we're managing for vegetation goals rather than for um, managing nutrition. Forage quality can be problematic. And then we can also have toxins both in our forages and in, in the environment that we need to pay attention to. Um, the ability to cover ground in a timely manner, particularly on cover crops is really important. The cover crop grazing that we did was in annual cropping systems and so those farms wanted us to get across their fields as quickly as possible so they could get on to the next stage of production. And um, we had to, had to make sure we could provide enough animals to get over that field as quickly as we could. Predator risks, even in town, can be an issue. Um, and in our area, this includes domestic dogs and teenage kids that think it would be fun to see if the electric fence is working. Uh, wildfire risk is always something that's not very um, far from, from our consideration here. We've also noted impacts on our conception rates. So uh, when we were doing lots of targeted grazing, we would have a 5 to 7% lower conception rate than when we really focused on, on reproduction. And that translate also into, into lambing rates. Um, we'd have, um, for a variety of factors, 30 to 40% more lambs once we started focusing on reproduction. Um, this next point kind of gets to the extra labor, but the work-life balance question, um, when you're grazing animals on somebody else's property, you do sleep with your cell phone by the side of the bed and you take those calls no matter what time of day or night they come, even if they're not your animals in, in, a, in a municipal grazing situation, um, you respond to those calls. And so being on call like that 24 seven is something to, to think about. It gets complicated the more landowners you work with. Um, that's kind of our complicating factor right now that we're doing um, fuel load reduction work for four or five different landowners and making sure we're matching everybody's needs um, in that regard is challenging. And then there's also for all of us, um, you know, there are particular projects that are easy to work on and particular projects that are a pain to work on. And, and over time, we realize we learn to kind of um, determine which of those are going to be a pain and, and charge accordingly. And with that, um, here's some more information from me, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And again, I'm really sorry to be under the weather tonight. Well, thank you, Dan. We can't blame you for that. I hope you rest up for the rest of the evening. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. We're going to have a question session coming up soon after our next speaker as well. So 
that would also be a great time if you're still thinking about what to ask. Um, so in the meantime, we have our next speaker, Stephanie Larson uh, from Match Grays, and she's gonna share a bit about her enterprise. So great. Hi, I'm Stephanie Larson. I am also a UC Cooperative Extension Livestock and Range Management Farm Advisor for Cooperative Extension in uh, Sonoma and Marin Counties. And I just want to take the opportunity to thank everyone for being here tonight. It's probably a warm night where everybody is, so I hope everybody's got a cold one and uh, enjoying this discussion. So I want to talk about Graze, and it is um, what I like to call the online dating service for grazers and landowners. So go ahead, uh, Rebecca, that would be great. So just kind of some, some background. Um, we in Sonoma County had a catastrophic fire in 2017. And what we found is that we weren't prepared at all um, when it comes to vegetation management. And then we proceeded to have one in 19 and 20, you know, because that was the thing to do because we didn't learn anything. And so I've really taken, um, you know, kind of an, an interest in leading an effort in our counties to look at vegetation management options and all the tools in the toolbox. And so when you think about how do I manage my vegetation, so you want to take into consideration what the cost of those tools are, the availability, the access, the practicality, the policies around using those different tools, the social acceptability, and the environmental impact. So we might use a tool some, such as um, chemical or prescribed fire, um, me mechanical, or, or bi biological, which is we refer to as grazing. Next slide. So, so why grazing? So I'm a very strong proponent of grazing because what I'm finding is when we use some of these other tools, which are all great tools, but they tend to, to be a one and done. So we do a prescribed fire, which is great. We have to have an, um, an activity, a management practice that allows us to maintain the vegetation at a level that we want. Because if we have a prescribed fire, catastrophic fire, or we use some other kind of management tool like uh, chipping or mastication, the vegetation is going to grow back. So the answer is then why graze? So we think about grazing can be more cost effective on landscapes that might be too steep or too rocky or too remote to use some of these other conventional management uh, tools like mowing and chemicals or in the urban wild interface or the WUI that um, where burning is not going to be an option. So Dan was talking about targeted grazing and so it's this whole idea of using livestock for a specific goal um, to reduce, you know, it could be invasive species, it could be in, to enhance their habitat, it could be for conservation, um, or in particular could reduce the fine fuels and lessen the, the uh, wildlife hazard. And so, uh, and then we want to make sure we choose the right animal. So, um, you know, it's, it's, if you're doing real specific targeted grazing, you might then definitely choose a specific animal for that. But if you're looking at more of the kind of the long-term management, you might choose a specific uh, animal like goats for initial brush removal. And once that's done, and maybe you might co combine that with mastication and or prescribed fire. Once that's done, then maybe you can look at to looking at more of a, a long-term sustainable management with uh, some, like cattle. And, and then looking at, you know, are you paying for that grazing or is the grazer paying the landowner to, to graze that or is there no exchange of money? So it's, it's looking at which is the right animal, which is the right model that's gonna work from a grazing perspective. Next, please. Also, you have to think about labor. So very high labor and targeted grazing, as Dan mentioned, is that you're moving those animals frequently, usually almost every day. And so you, and, it, and you might be grazing those animals in, in public areas. And so you have to think about the economics of it. And, and, and I wanna get into targeted grazing, but do I really want to um, sleep with my phone by my side all the time? So, um, and you're also having to deal with the public and other animals and maybe some, some predation. So thinking about those things. And when we think about uh, getting into the business of targeted grazing or, or just grazing in general, we have to think about animals and the equipment. So how are we gonna haul them? How are we gonna move them from place to place? And the whole idea is that animals graze year round. So if you're thinking about, I wanna do targeted grazing, you might wanna think about is maybe I buy those animals every year, or I have additional enterprises that maybe I do some kind of a, a meat 
opportunity to think about um, when I'm not targeted grazing, where am I going to put those animals and do I have a home ranch and trying to figure out that's the problem we've had with a lot of targeted grazing is that they're they're very busy for a six month period and then there might be three months they can pick up odd jobs here and there and then there's another three months that they have no place to put those animals so the whole idea of working with a landowner or a public agency of, of creating a home ranch to have those animals land when you're not but maybe when you're lambing or kidding or, or doing those kind of things so they do graze year round nutrition uh, very, very interesting is that when you are grazing, you have to think about um, the nutrition of your animals. And so you have to remember that you're out there as an as a ambassador for grazing. And so you have to keep your animals in good health. You want to make sure that they're getting nutritional forage, but you're also then achieve, trying to achieve a goal where you're targeting a, spe a specific time of year, specific species that may not be the best or have the highest nutrition. So Dan and I are going to look at this whole idea of how can we identify the plants and their and match the animals' nutritional needs with the plants' highest nutritional value, and then achieve still achieve the goals. So if you don't don't meet those goals of the animals, you might want to think about adding supplement. And then this whole idea of introducing plant uh, grazers to novel plants that they've never had before that might cause some talk to some toxicity problems, some poisonings. And the whole idea of grazing in an urban area, you might be um, having to put out signs to make sure that the neighbors don't try to feed your animals. Dan mentioned pred uh, predation and logistics, in particular in, in urban areas, is that you might have uh, lots of dogs that uh, people think are friendly and great, uh, don't think they'd ever chase your animals, and then they end up doing that. So again, the predation issue, logistics of that. And, the animal welfare, I think, is one that we really need to, to make sure we address and, and keep in mind. We're seeing this more and more in some of the urban areas where we're doing some grazing is that the urban folks think that the animals are cute, but they're maybe they're too skinny or maybe they don't get enough nutrition and they don't really know what they're what they're looking at and they know that the animals needs are being met. But we want to make sure that um, we are meeting their nutritional, um, their needs, their welfare, and that, that grazers have a protocol and, and, and in conjunction with their veterinarian. And so if they were ever asked by um, a, a public or an animal welfare control officer, you have the ability to say, is, here's my protocol for grazing to make sure that the, the needs of the animals are met. Next. Okay, so why graze? Let's look at it from a climate perspective. So uh, livestock grazing emissions are part of the biogenic carbon cycle. So where CO2 in the atmosphere is converted to carbohydrates in the form of through photosynthesis, through plants, they're grazed by animals, and then the, the animals release methane. It's what ruminants do. They ruminate, they, um, they produce methane uh, through their rumination. And that's an issue that we have to, to acknowledge and to address. And if we can move our animals if more frequently to higher quality forage, that will reduce the methane that is produced. And so kind of looking at that, that curve of making sure that the nutritional needs of the animals met, meeting our, our resource goals, we, we also might reduce the methane produced. So when we think about it, if we're using grazing as our tool, we're also can have the ability to improve our soil health. So it's gonna improve the soil microbe microbial health, it can sequester carbon, and it can act as a long-term GHG uh, emissions reduction. So again, grazing can do that. We all know that grazing can reduce the severity of fire by reducing the amount of fuels that are out there. And in general, it can reduce invasive species or weeds, and then thus reducing the need for mechanical control, uh, reducing fossil fuels, and the reduced needs for chemical or uh, herbicides for controlling those. So why graze? Question is why not? So just to kind of put it in perspective, if we're thinking about wildfire and grazing on rangelands, so if um, there was some research done that looked at if we burned a thousand pounds of dry annual grass, it's gonna generate five pounds of particulates and um, 1,892 pounds of CO2, also some methane and also some nitrous oxide. So it's not without, um, and, and 
this is you know more in, in more catastrophic higher, hotter fires but it could also be in more prescribed fires as well so the next slide is going to look at how that compares to if an animal was grazing a thousand pounds so that's going to feed that cow for one month and it's going to produce uh, about a fifth of the co2 equivalent so 375 pounds now it's gonna, as i mentioned ruminants produce methane it's going to produce a lot more methane but if we can look at how do we um, provide a higher quality forage to our animals that will help reduce that methane and so it's this idea that yes there is some ghg gases produced from a grazing animal but look at the the how we if we put an equivalent to a catastrophic fire what what does that really mean and what's what are we willing to um you know what's the mitigation here what are we willing to accept okay so just one last thing um, uh, before I jump into the match shot grays is that um, I think we need to look at opportunities missed. And are we, are we managing the vegetation, um, the acreages as much as we can and how much more grazing opportunities are out there? And I just kind of did a comparison of, of looking at, you know, if we were just to graze all the lands in Sonoma County that could potentially be grazed, um, you know, we're talking, you know, over half half a million um, acres that we could be grazing, and so the question is, you know, how many of that are we grazing? And then I, you know, looking at the whole entire Bay Area, um, you know, we're looking at um, two over two million, almost three million acres of potentially grazable land. Now, is it great grazing land? Um, you know, is it uh, a high quality forage? No, but it's it's looking at that these landscapes need to be managed and they need to be, uh, you know, so have some kind of disturbance because uh, with drought and climate change, we're really seeing a change in dryness of our rangelands and our grazable lands. And so maybe if we focus on the grazing lands and the grasslands and maybe a little bit of the shrublands, we can start to reduce the severities and maybe the, the incidence of catastrophic fires, and we can also provide more opportunities for our, our potential grazers. Okay, so what's matched dog graze? Get to the point, dear. So matched dog graze was uh, typically, it's, it's an online dating service. So um, you might've heard of match.com. So this is similar. It's, um, I put in a profile and I tell you that I'm a uh, cattle grazer and I'm in Sonoma County and I have 50 head and they're just the cutest little things ever. And I can have them to your place and I might, I cover Sonoma, Marin, Napa counties and I'll come and I'll graze down all your grasses, et cetera, et cetera. Or I'm a landowner and I say, well, I have 200 acres and I'm, I really don't know what I wanna do with it. Uh, but I'm, I'm worried about fire or I'm worried about this invasive species and then I'll put my profile up there. And then the idea is that if you're a grazer, you go online and you look for opportunities for grazing. So that's the website, that's the QR code. So it's a free online platform and it connects livestock producers with landowners throughout the state of California. So it's, it's all over California and it helps you to pair up animals and land base that you need. So this is a, a UCCE service that we provide um, we provide the, the, the site, um, but the matching is on your own. And it's, it's really in an opportunity to achieve these collective uh, habitat enhancement and fuel reduction goals. So it looks at um, uh, this opportunity to expand grazing for interested parties, uh, whether you're a landowner or you're a grazer. So I, I, I broke it down. Now I'm in Sonoma County and we are an urban rural county. So I've broken it down into three, three grazing tiers. So one of them is a community grazer. And this could fit into a variety of different areas, but we're looking at more of a, of a, you know, a, a community, a neighborhood that might have a quarter acre up to 10 acres kind of a thing. And so I'm, I'm a livestock person and I have livestock on my 10 acres. And I can contact my neighbors in that that community, and I say, I'm not, you know, I'm going to run the animals down the road, and I'm going to come to your property, and I can graze your, you know, quarter acre and reduce you from having to mow it, uh, reach, achieve your resource goals, and I'll go to the next one and to the next one. And typically, uh, no money is exchanged. You might have, um, 
it, because you're providing a service to the landowners so they don't have to mow their, their, uh, their grasses or are paid to have it mowed. And then you're providing, you know, getting some forage for your animals. And so I've seen this work really well in our area where we've got uh, you know, rural communities, rural roads, and so we can move the animals up and down. Typically, this is more of a smaller scale, but it doesn't mean you can't have cattle. So we're typically having goats and sheep in the community grazing. Targeted or contract grazing, Dan, I talked quite a bit about that, and that's where typically the grazer is paid for specific uh, target species, uh, targeted resource goal. Um, again, this is one that you're, you know, it's a short term, you're in, you're out kind of a thing. And then that leads to more of the commercial grazing. So that's where we have our, our production that Dan mentioned, the, the folks that are looking at production. And so they're paying for a grazing lease. So they may pay for a, a year, year to a longer term lease, 10, 15 years of a grazing. So what I'm looking at is this whole ability to kind of ebb and flow using these three different multiple scales. So I see having targeted grazing in areas that, uh, that we really have a, a large shrub and, and encroachment, a lot of areas that are uh, really steep that we have to get in with, you know, typically goats and sheep get in there when we really re we reduce that, that vegetation. We might also use prescribed fire to do that and then maybe do a little cleanup with the, the targeted and pay on that one or two years. And then looking at the whole idea of then implementing more of a long-term sustainable grazing program where we're um, working with NRCS and we're doing some, you know, some, maybe some more infrastructure, some water, some cross fencing. And then we look at more of a long-term um, grazing contract so that maybe the landowner isn't paying for grazing. Maybe the grazer comes in and pays for the use of that land. And then once you get something with NRCS and an EQIP grant, then once you get that established, the landowner and or grazer can apply for conservation stewardship, which will pay part of a prescribed grazing program. So there's opportunities to reduce the cost of um, getting to a more long-term commercial type grazing. So again, three different scales with grazing, not one size fits all, but looking at all these different opportunities. We've also got, if you go on the website, we've also got the local Cal Fire folks talking about grazing and the importance of grazing and how they've seen that grazing has reduced the length of the, the, um, the flame, flame lengths and that he, um, where they have seen fires stop right up to fences where grazing has occurred. And so looking at um, putting out more information to folks so they better understand that grazing is a tool and that it's supported by um, the, our trusted firefighters. So it's, it's really easy. You just go online, you create your account. I told you how you talk about, you know, how um, fancy your cows are, your goats are great, different things like that. You register a pin, so you drop in, you don't have to put your, let your address known, but you drop a pin of like what areas you cover, or what area is your home, and then hopefully you start doing the matching. And there is, there's uh, resources on the website on how to do that. So just to kind of show you when we launched this in February of 2021, we had a couple little dots. And I, as I checked last month, um, we've got dots everywhere. And that's great. That's really exciting. Those are, um, and they're, the pins represent goats, sheep, uh, cattle, and hor uh, horses. And so on this website, you can see interactive, the grazing map, the customable pins, there's a about page, there's resources, and there's a how to um, video. So after a year, I did a survey to find out, you know, how, how people thought about the, the match.graze. And so we need to do some more, uh, I'm trying to get more landowners to that website, more landowners putting their, um, their lands up there. Um, a lot more, I want to work on more getting more public lands up there. Um, so we're, we're wanting to kind of that highlight in figuring out like, Who's new to this site? Look at my fancy cows, you know, that kind of a, um, a thing and, and helping people differentiate the three, the three, three tier system. Want to also implement more into this website of kind of this chat ability to people to have contacts to chat. I might look at doing some something like a, a Yelp review so that folks can go, okay, how, how did that grazing do? Well, that grazing guy was great, but this one wasn't. Um, 
you know, I don't want to get into, you know, it's just more self-driven, but it's, it's to help people to, to, to say, um, and really to provide match suggestions. I don't want, we don't want to be doing the matching. It's kind of, that's the prop thing of it is like, it's on their own. Um, but just to, just to really make it more user friendly, easier to use, more maps. But what I'm finding is the, the really, really big one is just driving more people there, and particularly more lands, and getting more people to to accept grazing as a as a tool to reduce vegetation. Um, also, having people better understand what grazing might look like after it happens. You get a lot of times when people want to reduce all the vegetation so that the fuel uh, load is reduced and that means all the vegetation is gone and so when they see this grazed landscape they kind of freak out and so it's helping people to better understand what it's going to look like when grazing is finished obviously talking about the needs of infrastructure fencing water um, you know understanding that cost benefit ratio because grazing can be expensive at first so looking at that long-term trajectory of how you can manage your vegetation um, for the long term understanding the different uses because Goats are the thing. Everybody's very excited about goats, uh, but they cost a lot of money. So, and they're very hard to, to keep in, as Dan mentioned, into a fence, whether they're hungry or not, they just want to get out. And then the timing, when's the best timing? And then the leases and requests for um, proposal assistance. And so when you're working with public agencies, some of those are a little bit more difficult on how to apply for those. And so trying to, again, trying to add those additional resources for folks. Um, and like, like examples for um, completing the lease, bidding a job, et cetera, things like that. So we want to continue to put those resources so that folks um, and provide other training. So through grazing schools or just the ability to better understand, you know, how do I bid this job? How do I make this economically viable? And how do I, if I want to start a grazing business, how do I, you know, figure out the long-term sustainability of my, of my business and, and, you know, making those things work for me. And then having the landowner understand of what the short and long-term goals using grazing can be. So with that, it's just um, the graze, match dog graze is just helping people to understand tools to manage their, their lands, understanding vegetation management goals, and how you can use grazing to reduce fire fuels, carbon sequestration, um, implement, you know, increase your biodiversity. And that's just really what we want to do is, is make grazing um, uh, the go-to tool that people look at and, and to make it easier to do so. So thank you. And I'm, I'm open for questions as well. Awesome. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah. So like Stephanie said, now is a good time for some questions. If anyone wants to unmute themselves and jump in, please go ahead. Otherwise I can um, go through the chat here and see if there's some questions to answer. I see we have a couple. Hi, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So um, I'm in the Central Valley and I work as an assistant farm manager at a community garden and we just acquired a second space that has like 12 goats. I'm not sure what type or their ages or any of those details, but um, is there opportunity for us to perhaps see if there are folks who would like to bring our animals on? And if so, we would definitely require transportation um, help because we're not set up for that. But it is something that um, is interesting to me, especially for the wildfire mitigation benefits. Um, so just interested to see if there are programs or or things that help with transporting the animals to these spaces? You know, for, that's that's kind of the, the community level tier, I think, that Stephanie described. And I, I think um, most of the operations that I'm familiar with here in the foothills are pretty well self-contained, everything from the trailers to transport the animals to the fencing to the water troughs and um, there are folks that will haul for hire, um, but that's a typically a pretty expensive option, particularly at a smaller scale. Um, I think there's some some alternative ways. You don't <laughs> if you saw my truck and trailer, you know you don't need the fancy um, F2 brand new F250 and aluminum trailer to haul your your goats, and you can be 
you can be pretty low cost in that regard. And I think that's um, what most folks that I work with have, have done. Stephanie, what what's your what's your experience been? Similar, um, and my, I also didn't mention, but it, with your question prompted me to think about um, like a 4-H or FFA group. Yeah. That you know, it might be a nice connection in a community to bring a 4-H group in that might need some areas for grazing and and have them be in charge of you know managing the the, the livestock and to to do the transport as well. <coughs> So, yeah, small scale. It's um, they typically don't have those you know, the big trucks and trailers kind of a thing, but there might be you know mom and dad that have those. Yeah. Thank you. That's a really good idea, Stephanie, because uh, we just want to be active and be doing these principles. Uh, so, thank you for that. There's a question about transporting noxious weeds. Um, and I find a couple of things that we try to do. If we, if we know we're gonna be in an area with some invasive weeds, um, most of the weeds like yellow star thistle seeds are not gonna survive the trip through the rumen. Um, it's more of an issue of those seeds sticking on equipment or fencing or in the wool of our sheep. And so, we'll try to time our operation so that we're not transporting viable seed. Um, goat grass is an issue here in the foothills that we're really dealing with and, and we'll avoid goat grass after it's dried out um, for that very reason. Um, but it is something to think about um, managing and, and taking pretty good care of your equipment, um, those types of things. Stephanie, have you had experience in, in dealing with that? I know that you could um, also it, it said, you know, if you're hauling from some place to another place and where the animals were grazing, you could put in a, you know, what, 24 hour kind yeah. of a hold, in a holding pen to make sure that whatever was in their manure or in their um, system got through and out before you put it back out there. Yeah. Yeah. 